Okay, we're recording now, and we are doing lesson 7.8. Actually, we're starting it. This is a big lesson. We'll take a couple days for this. So we are solving problems using quadratic modeling. In other words, can I model the situation that I'm looking at with a quadratic equation? So check out this first example. FRC's choir is selling coupon books to raise money for an upcoming choir trip. When the price of a coupon book is $10, they know that 50 coupon books will be sold. The choir would like to increase profits from the sales of the coupon books. They know, I guess they've done research in the past, or they've just been doing this so long that they have old data. They know that for every $2 increase in price, five less coupon books will be sold. So somebody noticed, yeah, we've kind of seen a problem just like this before. Determine the price the choir should sell their coupon books for in order to achieve a maximum profit. Okay, so we're going to look at this as a table, first of all. And let's see what the, what the table does when we start putting money into it. Okay, so if, if we want to keep increasing the book price by $2, every time we do that, we know we won't sell as many. So this number is going up. $12, $14, $16, $18, $20. We've decided from the parameters of the question that we're counting by $2 price increases. But every time we do that, every time we go up $2 in price, we sell five less books. So we went from 50 books when we were $10 to when we changed to a $12 price, now we only sell 45. So you may be thinking, oh, well, that'll make the profit go down. No, it won't, because 12 is more than 10. Check it out. The profit here, which, of course, is just price times how many you sell, goes from 500, when they were $10, to 540, which is what 12 times 45 is. So even though I sold five less, because I sold them for $2 more, I made more money. But will that keep going forever? Obviously not. Eventually, you'll get to the point where you've increased the price so much that the number of sales that you went down will kill you. So where's that happening? Well, let's, let's play with the data some more. 14 would mean this drops down to 40. And 14 times 40, oh, we're up again. So 14's a better price than 12. Interestingly, 16 times 35 is the same thing that 40 times 14 is. So somewhere between $14 and $16 is the perfect price. And somewhere between $560 or somewhere just a little bit higher than $560 is the maximum amount I could profit off of this sale. Just to make sure that I'm not wrong about the way that this trend is going, if this was 30, 30 18s is 540 again, and 20 times 25 is 500. So, write the quadratic equation that represents this scenario. So there is two ways that you can do this. The first way is we'll use technology. So you're going to open Desmos. And when you open Desmos, you are going to look for this plus symbol someplace. See if you can find a plus symbol on your screen. When you hit the plus symbol, it'll ask you whether you want to put in an expression or a note or a table. You are going to want to put in a table. So click on table, and something like this should come up. Now, do you need all of these points? No, as a matter of fact, all you really need is three of them. But I, I actually did put them all in. So here they are. Keep the number of uh, steps I have to do here down a bit. Okay. So actually, why don't I, you know what, maybe I'll just copy them. I wonder if I can copy this whole thing. No, it doesn't, it doesn't appear that I can. Okay, so you're going to enter the chart that we just had. So it was 10 and then 50 and then 1245. 1440, and I've actually already, I, I really only need three dots, and the, the computer can figure out what the quadratic equation is. 
But here, I'll do the whole thing just to make life complete feeling here. There, oh, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't want these numbers. Sorry. I want the profit numbers. My bad. Sorry about that. Sorry, sorry, sorry. 560. And then this one was 560 again. And then this one was 540. And you know what? That's good enough. Okay, it should make sense to you that we're trying to link profit to what the price is. So X is the price, Y is the profit. How does changing the price affect the profit, right? Input, output, or to use science terminology, independent variable, dependent variable, right? So, now this is something that I don't know if you see on your phone, but anybody on a tablet or, or a laptop or whatever will totally see this. Do you see a magnifying glass here? See, some people are saying yes, and some people are saying no. So I guess it depends on what kind of settings and what kind of operating system your phone has. OK, those of you who have that, hit it. Hit Zoom Fit. And it, it finds where the graph is for you. So you don't have to play with the, the, the um, scale yourself. And as you can see, that's definitely a parabola looking thing. So now we're going to ask Desmos to find what quadratic equation will hit all those dots. So here's how we're going to do it. We have one set of data here. We're going to add more. There's going to be more examples coming. So we have one set of data here. So, so they've called it, notice, y1 and x1. So I need to make an equation for y1. So I literally just type y1. Now, in the real world, the data doesn't always make a perfect parabola. So a computer like Desmos or your TI calculator will give you the closest possible parabola to hitting all the dots that it can. So it gives you an approximation. The symbol for approximate is what in math? Yeah, it's called a tilde, and you can find it on your keypad if you click ABC and it's right down there. Of course, if you have a keyboard, it's top left on the keyboard. But there we go. That is telling, that actually tells Desmos, oh, you want us to find the best equation we can that'll hit all these dots. From here, what's the standard form for a parabola again? Well, standard form for a parabola is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So I need to type that in, except again, I have to tell it that we're dealing with data set number one. So I'm going to type in, I can go back to the regular keyboard now. I'm going to type in, um, oh, actually, maybe I can. A x one squared plus b x one plus c. Now get the keyboard out of the way, and it's telling you what a, b, and c are. And it graphed it for you, too. And as you can see, it perfectly hit all the dots. Now, what is the A value? There it is right there. Can you see that? Does it, it gives you a little printout on the phone, does it? OK, so it gives you negative 2.5 for A. It gives you 75 for B. What the heck kind of crazy number is that for C? What kind of a number is that? Can, do you remember how scientific notation works? Okay, so if I have a negative here, what does that do to the decimal? It moves it to the left. So it's actually point zero 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 zero. Stop when stop me when I hit thirteen zeros, so, or sorry, twelve zeros. So it's it's decimal twelve zeros then an eight. So you know what it really is? It's zero. How come it didn't just say zero? Because well, again, remember we were approximating. So Desmos was trying its best to give us a zero, but it didn't quite count that far. I'm just going to assume that that's zero, and I'm going to go back to my work now and say my equation is y equals negative 2.5. And again, where did that come from? 
from this A value. <laughs> then you probably entered the data set in wrong. I mean the chart of numbers. Check your chart. Do you have the exact same chart of numbers that I do? Okay, questions? Um, no, it'll probably say just round everything to two places. We'll let your science teachers worry about that. Okay, the question was, do I have to worry about significant digits? No. Um, okay, so let me finish this question off here. So 2.5x x squared, and then what was the B value again? That's how good my memory is. 75, thank you. Plus 75x, so the B value is, oh, ah, come back, come back. The B value is 75, and the C value, again, it was decimal zero, 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 ah, it was nothing, it was zero. So there it is, there is how we do this, and then of course, that was the B question, just write the quadratic equation. And then the C question, is there a C question? No, there is not a C question. I'm gonna make up a C question. <laughs> Underneath here, let's make up a C question. How much should, oh, is it on the next page? Oh, well then don't write that, it's on the next page. Okay, so on the next page, they give you a lot of room to do this, don't they? <laughs> Determine what the price the choir should sell each book is. So. To make a maximum profit, you have to look at your vertex, right? So your vertex is, let's see, where's that vertex again? My vertex is right there, 15 comma 562.5. So 15 comma 562.5. So I'm gonna write that down. 15 comma 562.5 is my vertex. Now, is 15 the price? And the answer is, well, no, it's not. Because, oh, actually, oh, I'm sorry, yes, actually, it is. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I meant the five, this is not, this, is 562.5 the price? No, that'd be a heck of an expensive book. So my price will be $15. And my maximum profit will be $562.50. Okay, that is the technology way to do this question. Wait, why is it 15 again? Because X was the price of the book. Right, go back to my chart. X was the price of the book. Y was the profit. That is not the only way to do this question. Okay, alternate strategy. If you didn't have the ability to do uh, a regression where you take all this data and it makes the equation for you, alternate strategy is you could make an equation letting x say alternate strategy. This is how to do it without any calculator. The alternate strategy, I, I, might, I wouldn't make you run through the entire problem the way I'm about to, but you might have to kind of, I could make up a multiple choice question. Let x equal, and I think we, we had an equation kind of like this in one of the examples before. Let x equal the number of times we increase price by two dollars. Stay with me. So if I say, okay, well, I would like to find my profit, which is a function of how many times I raise my price. Here's the actual equation. Now think about it. Profit is the amount of the price times the number of books we sell. I mean, that's how all business works, right? Retail is price times sales. And then of course you minus from that all the things that your overhead and how much it costs you to put the material on the shelves and stuff. 
So the price right now is $10, but I'm gonna increase either by one $2 amount or by two $2 amounts or by three $2 amounts. So it's 10 plus two X. Get it? If I don't increase the price at all, X is zero and it's a $10 book. If I increase the price once, it's $12, because two times one plus 10 is 12. If I increase the price twice, I'm at $14. Now, when I didn't increase my price, I sold 50 books. Every time I increase the price, I lose five sales. So that is my equation. What do you call this form of an equation? Remember this? This is factored form. It's really, really handy if you want to find x-intercepts. But of course, how do you find a maximum or a minimum? You're still going to use technology. Right? I, I told you you could do this now without any scientific calculator or graphing calculator because you could just multiply this out and then use algebra to find the vertex. But once again, we have access to graphing technology in this course. So we could graph that equation and we'd get the same result with, with one little hint, with one little trick. X this time isn't your price. So if I go to a graph here and I graph that equation, so let me, let me get a fresh graph here. So if I graph y equals, open a bracket, what did I say it was again? 10 plus 2x times, and then that was 50 minus 5x. And if I, okay, this time, this time because it wasn't a chart of values, I actually have to kind of drag my screen around to find a, yeah, it looks like a straight line, doesn't it? Oh, oh, there we go. There's my parabola. Isn't that a nice parabola? It's a little bit scrawny. Okay, well, we'll fix that. We'll say that the x-axis only has to go from, say, I don't know, negative 5 to uh, uh, obviously, a, obviously a thousand's a bit big. How about 30? There we go. There's our nice parabola. So there's our parabola. And what's our maximum here? Notice the y value is still the same because the y's are still counting profits. But now x isn't counting the price. It's counting the number of times I increase the price. So 2.5 is the answer. So I'd go back now and go, OK, so the max occurs at x equals 2.5. So then I could say, therefore, my maximum price to maximize my profits is when this x is 2.5. So I don't know why I put that in a bracket. I don't need to be a bracket. 10 plus 2 times 2.5. What's two two and a halfs, guys? Five. Two and a half plus two and a half is five, right? <laughs> Sorry. That was that sounded more complicated than it was. <laughs> All right, so there we go. So the, notice we got the same thing. Fifteen dollars is the price that would maximize. So I don't know which way do you like better. Um, Wait, how did you get fifteen bucks on the next page? How did I get fifteen bucks on the next page? Yeah, in the non-alternate chart. Oh, by reading it off the graph. Okay, let me go back to the first graph. So back to the first graph. There's the vertex. I thought the vertex was a number in the price. No, the, well, the vertex no, is, okay, the x coordinates the price, the y coordinate is how much that profit is. All right, so there we go. There's how you do a question like that. Let's try another one. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah, you, that's actually very smart of you. You might, somebody, notice the one question we didn't bother asking here was, well, how many books is that? Well, you could go back to this and say, aha, put that 2.5 in here, and it'd be 50 minus whatever 5 times 2.5 is. And yeah, that's going to work out to be a decimal. We've sold decimals of a book. 
yeah, that'd be fine. Maybe that's one of the reasons why this example doesn't ask that. Because <laughs> it works such a, such a nice working problem other than that one little problem. For those of you who didn't realize it, uh, it was just noticed that uh, if you tried to actually figure out what this exact best possible price is, it only works if you sell decimal something of books because five times 2.5, right? And same thing would be true even if I put it in here, right? If I put, this is, this is the equation when X is the actual price. Well, notice 2.5 times 25 is gonna give you a decimal, right? So either way, I'm going to get a decimal. Okay, anyway. Let's move on to growing some trees. A peach orchard will yield an average 100 pounds per tree if we pick now and can be sold for $1.45 per pound. If the farmer waits, the yield from the orchards will increase 10 pounds, but the price decreases by about 6 cents per pound per week. After how many weeks should the peaches be picked in order to produce a maximum revenue per tree? This is kind of a very common problem when you're trying to grow stuff. It's like exactly when's the best time to pick it, right? So, okay. Now, you might look at this and go, oh, yeah, I remember those things. Remember when we were using the TI and we were putting lists and statistics? They were called list one, list two, L1, L2. So obviously this, these notes were put together before we were using Desmos. But if we're using Desmos, we're going to see how many weeks results in profit or money earned per tree. So that's the Y and that's the X of our equation. And okay, let's fill in the chart. In week zero, if I picked right now, we pick 100 pounds, and we can sell it for $1.45. So, per pound. So that's why the next step is one more multiply, right? So if I have 100 pounds, and I'm selling it for $1.45 per pound, that's going to get me... $145 for my, what is this, pear or peach tree. Now, if I wait a week, I get 10 more pounds. The tree makes more peaches. But the price is going to go down. So, so exactly, by six cents, it says. So that's now $1.39. But this went up kind of significantly more than that. So this is, if you do the math here, you multiply that. That's still better for my sales. But obviously, this won't continue forever. Eventually, the price keeping on going down will kind of compensate for the fact that the poundage goes up. So 120 is $1.33, right? Six cents less again. And if I multiply those two together, hey, look at that. We're still going up. But eventually, this won't go up forever. There's going to be a maximum and then it'll start going down. And of course, my job is to figure out where that maximum is and I need a quadratic to do that. So, uh, once again, let's go to our Desmos and put this into a chart. So there's your chart. Now, I actually didn't start a new Desmos. I just started a new piece of, of chart here and, uh, oh, wait a minute. Did I, looks like I didn't even do that one. Oh, okay, fine. I'll, I'll just go to this one then. There. I'm going to start a new chart. So close that line. I don't want it anymore. And start a new chart. And notice now, because there's this is the second set of data that I have here, notice it says x2 and y2. So this is 0, 1, 2. If you, don't, if you didn't, it doesn't matter. Okay, and then 145. 152. Point, was it seven? No, point nine. And 159.6. By the way, if you ever wanted to learn how to use Excel, of course, you could make this entire chart, right? You could actually it would do the multiply for you and everything. You could program it to keep going down and adding 10 to this column and taking six cents off of that column. You could easily write a little equation in, in Excel. Anybody ever used Excel before? To keep track of data, maybe in your science classes and stuff? Yeah. 
<laughs> when it was a traumatic experience for you? Okay, well, I'm sorry to hear that because because Excel Excel in the business and the science world is pretty much the most commonly used spreadsheet program. All right, once again, hit that little plus button, and you'll find there's. Well, wait a minute, that's not it. Hang on, let's go. Ahead. Let's close. Turn that one off, and hit this one. There we go. Now this one, because I only have three points, doesn't really look like a parabola. In fact, doesn't it almost look like a straight line? Yeah. You could ask your equation editor here, your your um, your your, calc your computer. You could ask it to find whatever straight line comes closest to hitting those three points, but it wouldn't be perfect. You, if you actually do kind of look at it closely, there is not a straight line that would exactly hit those three points. So that's why you would think if you were out in the field and the science is going, hmm, it isn't quite perfectly linear. Maybe it's quadratic. So let's see if we can get it to think quadratically. So how do we do this again? Y2 is approximately AX2 squared plus BX2 plus C. This time the C value matters. And as you can see, the curve beautifully goes through all three points. So I might want to squish that down a bit. Squoosh it down some more. Squoosh it down some more. Aha! There we go. There's some up parabola. And now let's find its vertex. So once again, let me go back to my notes and write down the equation. So can you see the equation? A is negative 0.6. So y is equal to negative 0.6x squared um, and uh, plus 8.5x plus 145. And the vertex, according to my data here, my vertex is... 7.038, 7.083, thank you, I can't read, 7.083, comma, and the other in a, uh, coordinate there is 175.104. Maybe, maybe I, maybe I have a, a data point wrong, check my data here. Oh, uh, yeah, if you don't put the right little numbers on there, it doesn't know what data to take. Yeah. Oh, but you don't have a second list, so yours should just be Y1, right? Yeah. If those of you who kept your first list, your second list is automatically X2 and Y2, right? So I didn't even have to check Right, yeah, that's fine. Okay, so now, the I could train a monkey to do what we just did, right? It's like, you know, press buttons, E. You, you have to understand what it means. What, what does this tell us? There it is. This number is how many weeks to wait. Let's just round it to the nearest week. So harvest after seven weeks, and we should get a maximum revenue of about $175. If we waited longer than seven weeks, we wouldn't make more money because look at what the graph's doing. Now it's going down. Okay, any questions on how I did that? Yep. Oh, you have to type this in. And it's not showing you the line? Oh, is this thing? Can you look, look at my screen? Is that on? Really? Why is it not working? Well, again, different people's phones sometimes use decimals differently. I, I do recommend that you download the app if you can. What's yours doing? Oh, 
again, yeah, this these yeah, little twos are just because this chart is the second piece of data. Right? That way, the reason why Desmos works that way is that so that you could change something about a situation and then compare the graphs. Right? That's right. If you deleted the first one, then your, your equation here is just going to have ones in it. Yeah. One way or the other, though, when you're going from data to equation, you have to let it know, even if there's only one chart, that it's chart one. I don't, I don't know why it's like that. Okay. Where's my TI people? TI people, this works exactly the same way. In one aspect, it's actually easier. Here's how this works for TI. Let's, let's do a TI one for this. So it even kind of told us in the, in the booklet, let's look at the notes again. Let's go to the booklet there. It even told us in the booklet that, oh yeah, that's L1 and L2. So remember how to do this? You go, okay, first of all, make sure everything's off. Make sure you don't have a stat plot on already. Make sure you don't have anything graphed. Then you go to stat, edit your list, and then put in your list. Now, I have another list going here, so I'm going to put this in L3 and L4. It doesn't matter where you put it. So 0, 1, and 2. And then move over. Come on, move over. And then, what was it again? 145. 152.9. And 159.6. So there's my three dots. Now, how do you do the regression on this? Well, first of all, you, you should plot it. So you go second function, stat plot. Turn your stat plot on. Tell it what list to use. Remember, I didn't put this in L1 and L2. I put mine in L3 and L4 because there's another list I already, already there that I wanted to use. So, whoops, L3 and... L4, and then before you hit graph, go to zoom, stat, and this does the same thing that that little magnifying glass sorry, does in Desmos. It should find the data for you. And, oh, that didn't work. It should have. Maybe I didn't hit it right. Zoom, stat. Enter. There we go. There we go. And there's and notice that looks the same way Desmos looked. It just gives you those three dots. And again, it kind of looks like it's a straight line. But I, I do kind of know that this is a quadratic. And if I did try to make a straight line, it wouldn't exactly hit these three dots, which would make me think, hmm, maybe this is part of a quadratic curve. Now, how do I do the regression part? How do I find the actual thing? Well, you do this. You go stat, calculate, and can you see what number five says? Quadratic regression. And then you tell it which X and Y to use. List three and list four. And there's the same equation we got from Desmos. Negative 0.6 for A, positive 8.5, and positive 145. And then when I graph that, and I'll just type it in. There is a way to actually make it put this into the, the list yourself, but I don't remember how to do that. So let's see. So that's negative 0.6x squared plus 8.5x plus 145. And then when I graph it, there we go. It hits all three of those lines. Now, uh, again, I should probably play with the... Uh, the window here so that we can see the whole thing. Sometimes if you go, whoops, sometimes if you go, whoops, sometimes if you go zoom fit, it'll find it for you. Zoom fit. No, that didn't work. Let's try that. Maybe it's because I double clicked it. Zoom fit. And say, but I fit. I've got all three of your dots. Didn't you want dots? You know what? Oh, I know what I could do. If I turn off the dots, then it'll have no choice but to fit the line. Wahahaha. I, I have tricked you, calculator. 
Maybe I shouldn't be so confident. This might not work. Zoom fit. Yeah, didn't work. Okay, fine. I'll play with the window myself. So obviously the maximum of two is nowhere near where it should be. Let's try a maximum of 50. And then go to the graph. Well, that's a little too much. How about we have that, 25. There we go. We go up, we go down. Okay, I like the X. Now let's fix the Y. Um, 140, 160 is clearly not enough. So let's go to 200. Is that enough? Yeah, perfect. Now we do the same thing that we did on Desmos. We find the vertex. This is a little more work on a TI. You have to go calc, and vertex here is your maximum. So hit 4, and then make sure you're on the left side of it. So toggle your cursor over till you're on the left of the peak. And then toggle the cursor till you're at the right, right boundary. So yeah, there, just in case you're, you're graphing something with more than one peak. And then it'll do a guess, ignore the guess. And it's the same thing we got, 7.08 and 175. So this can be done on the TI pretty much the same way it works on Desmos. It's just a few more steps. And you have to pay for one of these calculators when Desmos is free. So there we go. Although it's not like this uh, app here that I'm using cost me anything. So anyway, moving along. Let's try one more. All right. I've used this example in class a couple times talking about how the Jets decided how the size to build their arena. They would also use similar math to set their ticket prices. In a hockey arena, if there's 2,000 seats, the price of a ticket's $15. All the seats are sold for every game. So assume that we have sellouts. We sell out when we're 15 bucks a, a seat. The manager needs to increase the revenue, though. So she commissions a survey that predicts a drop of 80 tickets every time you increase the price a dollar. So complete the table below. So we know that if we stay at $15, we sell the place out. 2000 and 15 times 2000 is $30,000 in, in revenue. If we increase the price by a dollar, you lose 80 tickets every time. So that's now 1920. And if you multiply 16 by 1920, you actually go up. So even though you'd have a few empty seats, You'd make more money. I know when I watch uh, some uh, out-of-market NHL games and you kind of look and go, man, that, that arena looks empty. But that doesn't mean that the team is, is not doing well because, boy, a lot of the money comes from those corporate seats, you know, those box seats that are around kind of just behind the, the, the front seats where, you know, you have little offices and people sit kind of by themselves and they have their own waiters and waitresses and stuff. That's where all the big money is. So anyway, if we bumped up to $17, we lose another 80. So that's 1840. But if you multiply, we're still going up. So even though we're up to 160 empty seats, I'm still making more money than I was making when I sold the seats cheaper, but we had a sellout. But will this keep going forever? No, it can't. But it certainly keeps going for the next one. 1760 times 18 is still more money. And we'll do one more. If we drop another 80 tickets, but they go up a dollar, I'm still increasing. But notice, you can kind of see it coming here. This increased me, look at from here to here. This increased me by 700 bucks. This one increased me by about 500. This one increased me by maybe 400. This one didn't even increase by you know, a little over 200. So the amount that we're increasing is going down. So this can't continue forever. We're building up to a peak and then we'll start losing money. I wanna know what that peak is. So uh, feel free TI people to try the TI again. We just showed you how to do the TI, but I'm gonna go back to Desmos. So let's see, I think I already have this one in here. Yeah, I do. There it is. 15, 30,000. 16, 37, 20. Let me just double check that I put the numbers in right. 17, 
31 280, 18 31 680, and 19 31 900. Okay, I'm going to pause the video here. Type in that data while I do attendance. And we're back. Hopefully, everybody had enough time to put this data into Desmos. And then, okay, once, now make sure everything else is off. Make sure any other data you have here is all empty circle. It's all off. And then click on this one. And when you click on this, that little magnifying glass should pop up again, which then makes Desmos find you your dots. There they are. Once again, boy, that kind of looks like it could be a straight line, but not quite. So let's see if we can make this. Now, I have this as X2 and Y2 in mind. For you, it might be x3 and y3. One way or the other, we're going to put in an equation. Let me just move this up to where my data is. There we go. OK, so I want y2 is approximately ax2 squared plus bx2 plus C. And what's my vertex? Notice that I don't know how good your colors are on your screen. Notice all the dots that I put in are, are some color like green. And notice that the ones that they give you, that they figure out for you, are gray. So that's a kind of a nice thing because you're just looking at your data going, oh yeah, that's the one it found for me. There's my, there's my vertex. So my vertex is 20 comma 32,000. So my Complete the table below and then predict the ticket price. Notice it doesn't ask for the equation this time. It's fine, so I won't bother writing it down. But I'll write down that the vertex, if I could remember it, is 20, 32,000. Thank you. Is 20, 32,000. So again, what do those two numbers tell you? The ticket price of $20 gives... Uh, maximum revenue of $32,000. So let's see. So where would 20 have been on here? 20 would have been 80 less. So having 400 empty seats but charging five more dollars a ticket is the best business strategy in this case. Of course, then that would allow you to maybe take those extra seats and give them away as advertising, right? Give them away in radio giveaways and stuff. People are like, how can they afford to give away some free tickets? Well, that's that's advertising. That's part of your advertising budget, right? Okay, the next example is a little different. Check this one out. First of all, it's got this really complicated looking diagram. Oh, did I lose you somewhere? Okay, well, did you did you type it in just like this? Regression. Then it should pop up, and then you should just be able to hover your mouse over. Just hover your cursor over the vertex, and it should tell you exactly what it is. And if you don't have the exact same vertex I do, go back to your chart. You might have typed a number wrong. All you have to do is type a number off by, a, like, one digit, and it'll knock... Your, your vertex out a little bit, okay? All right, I'll come back to you, okay? Let's move on to the next one here. All right, so the next one is the record distance in running long jump. So check this out. The guy jumps, oh, look at the physics on this with, with velocity vector one and an, an angle A. Oh, isn't that all interesting? You know what, none of this stuff really matters that much. Look at the numbers that it gives you in the, in the, in the question. The, the height, the, the record distance in the long jump is 8.95. So I'm, I'm going to put the 8.95 down at the bottom here. That's, that's the actual longest one. Now, what's this person's height off, in the, off the ground when he gets to there? Well, zero, because he's on the ground. Where did he start from? Probably zero, zero, right? At distance zero, he's still on the ground. And then he starts jumping, right? So this point here is... Uh, 8.95 away from where he started, zero. This is the point where he started, so that's zero, zero. But it doesn't give me both coordinates for the middle. It only tells me that his center of mass, his height 
All that it tells me is that his height is 0.72. I need three dots or I can't do my regression. How do I find how big this is? Any ideas? Exactly. Somebody said it. Parabolas are symmetrical. Ooh, what do I call this line that I'm drawing again? That's right, my favorite metal band, axis of symmetry. This is exactly half of the distance between the two x-intercepts. So what is half of 8.95? 4.475, so that's it. That's my, new, that's my last point. So I just figured this one out. It's 4.475. And I'm ready to figure out the equation that represents this jump. So I would say height is equal to, so I'll make h height and I'll make x, or I could make d for distance, how about that? It doesn't matter if you use x or y, you can use h and d. So height is equal to something d squared plus something d plus something. Well, yeah, something. Otherwise known as a, b, and c. So let's put those three things into Desmos and see if we can find them. Okay, let me get back to Desmos here. There we go. Okay, so now I gotta shut this one off. And there's my new one. Now again, for me that that is, uh, what is that? That's, that's X3 and Y3. So enter that data. And then here, I'm just gonna make my life easier. I'm just gonna change these twos to threes. I don't know how easy this is to do in your phone. How easy is it to control exactly where your cursor is? Is it easy for you? I find that very maddeningly, frustratingly hard when I'm playing with my phone. So there it is. Now this is not the nicest bunch of numbers in the world. And oh, I guess I gotta turn, turn these dots off, turn off those dots, turn on my new dots, and then that means it's gonna find them for me. There they are. And does that go through all of them? Oh, look at that. Dum -da -da -dum. So there's the, there's the vertex. Goes through the two x-intercepts we talked about. So there is, interesting, c is zero. Actually, you know what? It should make sense that c is zero. Why should it make sense that c is zero? Because, oh yeah, c is the y-intercept. And didn't we go through zero, zero? Yeah. So yeah, so it makes sense that there is no c value. So there it is. So I would just copy that out. So I may round it to say, two significant digits, how about that? So negative 0 0.036. It isn't, I just did the exact same thing. I just decided to save myself some button punching because I already had stuff going on. So here we go, and then uh, 0 0.32, if I use two significant digits. And of course, we just said zero. So my equation is height is negative 0 0.036 distance squared plus 0 0.32 times distance. That's the equation that represents the path. Again, did you put the right things in to the chart? And does your equation look like mine? I'll give, give you a sec to look at the screen here. Make sure that yours looks like mine. Make sure that it makes sense to you how we got that. Okay, that got us to the halfway part. That's kind of as far as we got. 7.8 does have an assignment. Oh, yeah, I'm afraid it does. Okay, I'm going to stop the video there. <laughs>